This video covers the first part of section 3.5, Proofs in Set Theory. We introduced the basic notation for sets in section 2.3, the two fundamental relations associated with sets, the equality and the subset relations, involve biconditional and conditional statements respectively. In this section, we want to apply the techniques developed in section 3.4 for proving conditional and biconditional statements to proofs involving sets. We'll start by reviewing the definitions. We let A and B be sets, then A equals B, denoted with the usual equal sign, provided that A and B contain precisely the same elements. In symbolic form, A equals B provided that, for all X, X is an element of A, if and only if X is an element of B. <coughs> a is a subset of B, denoted with our subset symbol, provided that every element of A is also an element of B. In symbolic form, A is a subset of B, provided that for all x, x is an element of A, implies x is an element of B. We write, we put a slash through the subset symbol to denote that A is not a subset of B. We can also define a proper subset. A is a proper subset of B, with our subset symbol missing the horizontal line underneath it, provided that A is a subset of B, but A is not equal to B. And then we can put a slash through the proper subset symbol to denote that A is not a proper subset of B. In both of these definitions, we usually assume the sets A and B are themselves contained in some larger set, which is called a universal set. The domain of the variable X in both definitions is then assumed to be the universal set. The universal set is often determined from the context of the discussion and the specific mathematical objects under consideration. For instance, if we're considering functions in calculus, the sets that arise may be subsets of the set of real numbers, in which case we can use R as the universal set. If we're proving results in number theory, the set of integer Z may be an appropriate universal set. In many cases, the universal set is left unspecified. Now, given two sets A and B, to prove that A is a subset of B, we need to prove the universally quantified conditional statement for all X, X is an element of A, implies x is an element of b. Since this is a universal statement, we start with a proof by arbitrary element. We then need to prove the conditional propositional function. The template for a direct proof of a is a subset of b, our first step is to specify the variable. So we suppose x is an arbitrary element of the universal set. Next, we suppose the hypothesis is true. So we suppose that x is an element of a. Now we can often omit mention of the universal set and combine steps 1 and 2 into a single statement and we can just say suppose x is an arbitrary element of A. Third, we need to show that the conclusion is true. So we need to show that x is an element of B. Now as usual, with a proof by arbitrary element, we must be careful to treat x as an arbitrary element. We must show that x is an element of B using only the hypothesis x is an element of A. For an example, to get us started, let's look at this. We want to prove for all sets A, B, and C, if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is also a subset of C. First step is to write this in symbolic form. So we have for all A, for all B, for all C, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, implies A is a subset of C. Now that we have the symbolic form, we can start the proof. This is a universal statement, so we'll use a proof by arbitrary element. Suppose A, B, and C are arbitrary sets. We suppose the hypothesis, A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of C, and we need to show the conclusion, A is a subset of C. To show A is a subset of C, we go back to the definition of a subset, and in symbolic form, we need to show for all X, X is an element of A, implies X is an element of C. This is now a universal statement, so we're going to use a proof by arbitrary element to prove it. We suppose x is an arbitrary element, suppose x is an element of A, and we need to show x is an element of C. Now, according to our hypotheses, our first hypothesis says that A is a subset of B. So since A is a subset of B, then x is an element of A implies x is an element of B. Our second hypothesis tells us that B is a subset of C. So then x is an element of B implies x is an element of C. And this is what we needed to show. So this proves what we needed to show, so proves our result, and we can conclude that A is a subset of C. 
Now note how the hypotheses A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C are used in the proof in this example. The hypothesis A is a subset of B means for every element Y, Y is an element of A implies Y is an element of B. And here I've used Y for the variable since in the proof we're already using X for another variable. Since this universal statement is true, then the conditional propositional function is true for each element. Since we're assuming that the particular element x belongs to A, then the hypothesis of this propositional function is true, which means the conclusion is true. We can then conclude that x belongs to B, which is what we did in the proof. Similarly, the hypothesis B is a subset of C means for all z, z is an element of B implies z is an element of C. And since we've now concluded that the particular element x belongs to b, there's a typo in the notes, should be b instead of c, then the hypothesis of the propositional function in this statement is true, so we can conclude that x belongs to c. In both instances, we are applying or specializing the universal statement to a particular element. Since the hypothesis of the propositional function has been assumed or shown to be true for a particular element, then we can conclude that the conclusion is true for this particular element. We could write the symbolic forms for each of the hypotheses, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, in the proof itself. Instead of writing these out, however, it's better to just refer to how the hypothesis is used by writing, as I did in the proof, since A is a subset of B, then X is an element of A implies X is an element of B. One thing to definitely avoid is substituting the symbolic forms for the hypotheses and conclusion into the symbolic form for the statement being proved. That is generally, that it, it is generally not helpful, and in fact it's usually confusing and counterproductive to substitute the symbolic forms into the symbolic form for the original statement to be proved. If you do that, as you can see in the slide, you obtain an enormously complicated symbolic form. It's so complicated that it obscures rather than informs you about how to approach the proof.